and welcome to Right Now. I'm Stephen Kent. So far, so good. I don't think I've said anything that will get me canceled, but it's hard to know. The mute button is my best friend. So maybe you've tried, but I simply cannot hear you. Now, we all know how this goes. Someone who already hates you teams up with people you've never met in your life. They go, go through your social media laundry. They find something they can drum up outrage about. And your sin against them, either real or imagined, you know, either way, you have to apologize, do better, resign, and go broke and penniless. But in the end, you're not actually forgiven for anything because there's nobody to give you forgiveness for anything at all. You can't move on, you can't learn, you can't grow. We all know what cancel culture is. Maybe you think it's imaginary. But for those of you living on Earth, you've seen it in action, and it's so much dumber than we really give it credit for. Like we all get distracted by instances where someone like uh, journalist Alexi McCammage, formerly of Axios and Teen Vogue, said something racist as a teenager and couldn't get beyond it with her new colleagues at Teen Vogue. And when a huge amount of this stuff happens in daily life, it's actually just way more ridiculous than that, and yet incredibly vicious. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my closest run-in that I ever had with being canceled. But first, a quick request to please subscribe to the show on YouTube and check us out on Twitter and Facebook at RightlyAJ. Leave a comment, I will reply to you personally, and I promise not to ever cancel you, no matter what. Um, if you are listening to the podcast, really appreciate it. Leave us that sweet five-star review. It makes a huge difference in getting the show out to more people on Apple Podcasts. All right, let's do the show. My guest today is someone who experienced cancellation firsthand, numerous times actually, and has come out on the other side. She's a YouTuber, gamer, and co-host of the Subtweet This Podcast, Vanessa Gothics. Welcome to Right Now. Hello, and thank you for having me. Yes, good morning. I'm so Glad to have you on today because the world is talking about cancel culture. And I'm of the mind that we no longer need to prove that it exists. Maybe, maybe you agree with me on that. And I want to talk to you about how to beat it, which I suppose is like the next phase of this conversation. Do you think that we have to prove that it exists anymore? Or is this, is this an open and shut case? It should be an open and shut case, but I find a lot of the times people will still claim that cancel culture does not exist. And then I'll pull out a document uh, of just, you know, all of, uh, you know, all of the people that have maybe, uh, you know, unfortunately committed suicide as a result of this. I know I'm jumping right in going really dark here. Uh, but there are, you know, to, to say that it doesn't exist, I find very uh, delusional in a way. Um, yeah. So uh, it exists. Yeah. So, I want to talk about origin stories. Um, I'd love to hear sort of more about what was your sort of initial run in with cancel culture that helped you become the person that you are today uh, by starting with my stupidest incident of ever being close to canceled. And, and I want to preface this by saying um, it wasn't that bad in retrospect. It was one of those things where like in the moment you're like, oh my God, I think the walls are closing in on me. This is getting really bad really fast. But it didn't ever reach the kind of uh, levels that you've experienced. So this is my very controversial mug. I am the Senate. It's a Star Wars themed mug that I made for my podcast audience, <laughs> uh, making fun of episode three's I am the Senate line using the Senate majority leaders, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer. Star Wars Twitter was so mad. And the claim was that I was using the likenesses of white supremacists to promote my Star Wars podcast and infusing the essence of white supremacy with the love of Star Wars. And I just was so confused, Vanessa, because <laughs> there's like hundreds of tweets from people I've never met in my life claiming that Chuck Schumer is a white supremacist. <laughs> I just, I don't get it. So, uh, so just to be clear, you got canceled <laughs> over a mug. I did. I it did. It is crazy. I did. Uh, it yeah. went on for like two and, days. You know, that, yeah. 
That is nuts. Well, in the explanation that you that they gave you, that is some crazy mental gymnastics. And one thing that I always like to do is try to get people to reverse engineer their logic, because sometimes they'll spew out a bunch of nonsense about connecting this mug to white supremacy or whatever. It's like, okay, break it down for me. Let's reverse engineer. If you can come up with this explanation, I should be able to understand it. So explain it. Uh, But, you know, as you said, though, the first time you've been canceled, it's usually the worst time uh, where you're kind of caught off guard. So uh, but over a mug. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And and that's just, you know, there's there's so much focus. And I kind of alluded to in our intro, like you, you there's all this talk about like the, the most egregious instances when people actually do something, you know, kind of bad and they need to atone for a racist remark when they were a teenager. But so much of this is stupid. And I thought your cancellation origin story was about Trump or politics or Black Lives Matter. And that ended up not being correct the more that I looked into this. This was about cartoons, right? Can you tell us a little bit yes. about your <laughs> your first cancellation? Because it's, it's bizarre. Okay. So uh, Disney uh, has been doing a lot of live action, ver- uh, you know, versions of their pre-existing movies. And so they announced that they're going to do a live action of uh, the Little Mermaid, which is one of my favorite animated movies growing up. And uh, but they said that this time Ariel's going to be black. And I was very confused by this. I am someone that rejects this idea of race baiting or gender swapping pre-existing characters, because from a creative standpoint, it lacks creativity. And they call it like race and bending, from a business right? Stand- yeah, race bending. And from a business standpoint, it seems more of a cash grab than actually uh producing something original and creative. And uh, so when they announced that, I I started to see people uh, claim that those who are opposed to this were racist. And and I am opposed to it because, again, like I just mentioned, I figured this is a cash grab. And uh, so I said, OK, well, racism is a very serious term. I don't think we should just be throwing it out over a difference of uh, opinion in regards to a cartoon. And, you know, Twitter didn't like that. Uh, apparently, the race card should be thrown around, you know, very you know, and so at this time you had you had centered I, your life around Twitch, right? Like that's kind of where you had made your living, like doing video game streaming, stuff like that. Yep. Yep. I was on Twitch at the time. And uh, that was the first thing that set everything in motion for me to pretty much be pushed out of the Twitch community uh, because I realized how oh, one sided it, uh, that platform is politically. And it was even more so obvious when we got closer towards the last election that just happened. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's uh, but yeah, I, I got canceled over The Little Mermaid. <laughs> that is that is such a bizarre choice of things to go after people for. I mean, like that's a it's a it's a valid area to debate whether or not like your love of a character is tied up specifically like in the way they look. Like I want to talk about race bending just for a second because. Probably the only area in which I ever felt a little defensive about a character that they were talking about recasting was in the James Bond debate. It was over Idris Elba, right? It was mostly like a Twitter, like Twitter wanted Idris Elba to be James Bond. And it was mostly just to, I guess, make like white fans on Twitter angry and then push it as far as it could go. And that was the only time where I went, you know what? Like, why are we doing this? What's the point? Is it to try to make a good Bond movie? Is the point to try and continue the James Bond legacy? Or is it literally just to make a point? And I feel like what you were going after with the Ariel thing was, this isn't about anything specific. It's just about trying to ruffle people's feathers and make a couple dollars at the same time. Yeah, that's what it seems like to me, because I usually find that when an online mob uh, is able to dictate what type of thing, what type of changes can be made, uh, whether it be like in movies or, you know, comics. And I see it a lot in the comics uh, field where uh, people will advocate for these changes and they might not even be the core consumer of that product. They just want to see more representation, uh, you know through like skin color and they might not even purchase the thing that they're advocating for. So I think that these companies, when they make these changes, they're doing it thinking that uh, these people are the majority. But I, I believe that they're actually just the loudest and they're the ones that make the most noise, but they're not the ones that are actually going to be 
uh, purchasing this product when it's all said and done. Yeah, no, I, it's it's like this weird tyranny of the minority sort of thing where you just wonder, like, is the actual fan base for this really invested in it? Like, Star Wars fandom is like this all the time. It's the most popular franchise in the world, but for some reason, it caters to the smallest subset of its audience, which is just focused on Twitter, these sort of far-left fans. Um, but, you know, like, with Idris Elba and James Bond, I thought, like, what they ended up doing was interesting in that they ended up casting this woman by the name of Lashana Lynch, who's going to be the next 007, but she's not James Bond, right? Like Idris Elba is going to be James Bond, make James Bond black. But then they decided instead to hand off the 007 tag to another agent. And that I went, okay, that's clever because I 007 can be anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and that's uh, that's sort of the weird ways in which I think you can advance this sort of stuff without trying to be controversial and divide people based on race. But I di I diverge. So the the next chapter in your story, like you you leave Twitch, right? So it was like because of demonetization, right? Like you were not able to run your sort of business there, right? Uh, you go over to YouTube, you do a walk away video, and that's sort of like mm -hmm. the next big thing that helps blow you up on this next big platform. Why the walk away video? Like why the, the switch to um, cancel culture kind of like ruined part of my, my livelihood. I'm building something new over here. I'm going to take it out on the Democratic Party. What was sort of your connection and, and, the, and the step that you made there? So it really started because of Twitch. Um, so as a, going back to what I said uh, towards, you know, the election last year, or really when Black Lives Matter kind of reemerged uh, last summer. I started to see on my Twitter feed a bunch of content creators on the Twitch platform were openly just bullying and harassing people that uh, weren't either putting a hashtag up and saying something about BLM or uh, they were harassing people uh, uh, that were found to not be supportive supportive of Biden. Uh, so. And I'm looking at Twitch like, are you going to do something about this? Because these people, you're allowing half of your creators to just harass one another and you're not actually saying anything about it. So it seems a little bit a little bit biased in a way. So uh, I I went over to YouTube and I did my walk away video. And this was after, you know, months of researching and trying to figure out where I stand on the political spectrum. And I still say that I'm politically homeless. Were you a Democrat but before? I definitely. Yeah, I was yeah. A, I was a Democrat. I was really not a voter. I voted for Obama, right. but I voted based on identity politics. And back then I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. Um, so I, I said, let me make a walk away video because there's something very uh, interesting about being told that if you if you vote for Biden, you're a good person. If you don't vote for Biden, you're a terrible person. But then the people telling me that I'm a terrible person based on how I vote are being uh, they're being bullies. They're being terrible. And, and they're I'm mostly like, this white isn't people, making right? sense to me. <laughs> Say Most, that again. <laughs> mostly white girls on Twitter are the ones doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I mean, and it's crazy because you you make a good point. I I've gotten so much vitriol uh, from people that are white um, who are trying to fight racism, but then they'll being racist towards me and I'm still having trouble figuring this out. So, yeah, I, I think one of my first few videos I posted on YouTube was about uh, walking away and uh, so where I didn't you really have much to? backlash. Uh, I walked uh away but <laughs> not to anywhere else <laughs> like no i guess like, like did you go to like the land of the politically homeless or did you or did you sign I, up yeah, republican that's um and just change teams so, yeah I, i'm politically homeless uh because i again i've i've never really paid attention to politics like i said i would just vote based on identity politics so i i feel uncomfortable even committing to a specific side so i'm just like i'm fine just being in the middle doing my own thing and just assessing things on a case by case basis yeah i mean do you consider yourself conservative libertarian i remember i remember i can't remember which video it was but you had talked about like not hearing about the libertarian party until you were an adult uh, uh, and it it might be perfect for you. They take you. Yeah. Well. So yeah. I. It was shocking to me. I said, "What the heck is this? I've never heard of this party before." <laughs> so um, I find Most that a lot have. of my values. 
tend to align more with being libertarian. But again, I'm just like so cautious of saying like, I am this, I am conservative yeah. or whatever, because I find when you put labels on things, people expect you to adhere to some sort of a template. Uh, and I don't like that. I don't like being boxed in. Uh, so I, I prefer just like no labels. If people call me conservative, I'm like, eh, whatever, it's whatever. Yeah, uh, I, I'm yeah. conservative when I am amongst libertarians, and I'm a libertarian when I'm amongst conservatives. I just, I just don't like it when I'm around people who all agree, and I'm just like, eh, well, actually, it's just, uh, it's just sort of in my nature. But I, I want to talk to you a little more about kind of the the bones, the fabric of cancel culture. Um, you know, people went after you for this take on Ariel and the Little Mermaid. And it just makes me wonder, like, what is the goal here? What is the point of cancel culture? There's no one to apologize to for you wanting Ariel to remain, a, I don't know, a Norwegian white girl with red hair. Um, there's no one for me to apologize to for really liking politics and having a Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell Star Wars mug. What's the point? And I, I don't get why this happens in the first place. What's your take on that? That's the thing. There isn't a point. And uh, one thing that I've, uh, you know, gained the courage to do is challenge these folks when they are participating in these uh, mob campaigns. And, and I'll ask them, like, apologize for what? What are you trying to do? What's your goal? And even when I, you know, I'll debate people when I'm streaming on YouTube about this and uh, and and it usually boils down to oh I'm helping cuz I'm I want to spread awareness. Okay, well we're aware. So what next? <laughs> <laughs> and I I find that if you just challenge these folks and ask basic questions like what are you trying to do? Apologize for what? You kind of back them into a corner because when it's all said and done, they there really isn't any reason for them to be doing this. And I think I I suspect it's people with a little bit of a hero complex that feel that they are helping in some way, not being able to self-analyze and see that their actions creating this massive campaign to target someone is actually worse than the thing that they're, uh, uh, you know, than the problem in the first place. You know, me getting harassed for a week, I would say that that's more harmful than my opinion on, hey, stop calling people racist over The Little Mermaid. Why will you not listen to POC, Vanessa? <laughs> I'm sorry. The, um, I don't. The, so like the apology thing, I this is where I get into arguments with, I think, people who are like-minded on this issue. Um, I am worried about uh, the rising culture of shamelessness that is happening all across the political aisle. Uh, it was when Trump first ran for office in, in 2016, uh, he did an interview, I can't remember with whom, it might have been Lester Holt, and I think he asked him, like, have you ever asked for forgiveness for something? Because they were talking about his quote-unquote faith. Uh, and he had said, he said, no, I've never, I've never asked for forgiveness. And I went, oh, that's not gonna be good. That's, that's a no for me, dog, because I need a guy who at least like understands brokenness and the need to apologize, the need to atone in life. And I worry about the backlash to cancel culture being, I'll never apologize for anything. Because you're right, you can't apologize to these people. But shouldn't we always remain like open to that in some way? I think that we should remain open uh, to apologizing. Uh, I think that apologizing is, uh, is good if it makes sense. So to apologize to a bunch of random strangers on the internet that you've never interacted for about <laughs> something that does not concern them, I find that ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also, if someone were to actually do something wrong, like let's say, uh, you know, it was a situation of someone did something to someone, like let, it happens a lot with content creators, I notice, where they'll try to cancel a YouTuber over some drama that that YouTuber had, but they that still may not concern them. But let's say for the sake of the argument, they actually did something wrong. Mm -hmm. Apologizing isn't going to do anything because what I've learned firsthand, uh, just by observing, is once you apologize, the mob owns you, yeah. and the mob will never—they uh, will never be satisfied. Your apology will never be good enough. And once you apologize, they know that they can just push you around. It's—it's it's this dark cloud that always follows you. And I have never apologized for any opinions that I have had, and slowly the mob has kind of dissipated, and. Uh, the conversation has shifted from let's hold gothics accountable to 
let's leave her alone because she's uh, getting more publicity every time we mention her. And that's fine with me. <laughs> so that works out for me. Yeah, I mean, your notoriety grows with cancel culture, but like it is sort of an outlier when people not become not become wealthy. That's not the word I'm looking for, but like they're able to like really grow like a personal small business, streaming, YouTubing, doing whatever off being canceled. Surely doesn't happen to most people. Um, it's really a select few who rise to the top of that. And I admire so much what you've done by just standing up and saying no. Um, and people want that. And I, look, I, the reason I wanted to talk to you is just because I don't know what I would do, right? If people come after me in a certain way, like they've come after you, you know, it's, it's hard to just say no to these people, stand up, not apologize, not do the self-reflection thing, do better. Um, we need more people like you who do that, but it's, um, I feel like it doesn't always work out for everybody who tries. It, it doesn't. Um, and I'll be the first one to tell you that the first time I was canceled, it was very traumatic. I, it made me very depressed. Uh, it rendered me pretty much like in, you know, incapable of making a living for a good portion of my year because I like the psychological, uh, effects that, uh, you'll have to endure by dealing with the mob because let's be real. Nobody's brain is built to withstand harassment by the thousands. Like mm -hmm. it's a, no, nobody's set up for that. Um, and you know, the first time is always the worst. And so I suspect that this cancer culture thing has been getting so out of hand that it's, it's going to keep, uh, infiltrating just regular citizens. Even if you're not a creator or someone that's a public figure, it could just be, you have a Facebook account and you say the wrong thing. Next thing you know, someone's calling up your job to get you fired. Uh, so as much as I would love to say that it's not going to happen to everyone, I feel like at some point, if you have a social media account or an online presence, you're going to get canceled. Yeah. Um, and as far, as far as like getting through it, uh, I think that People should remember that you owe the mob nothing. These are still strangers at the end of the day. And if there's something that you actually like legitimately did wrong, there's something called due process. This idea of the Internet or Twitter, uh, you know, dictating if you're guilty uh, is ridiculous. Um, and I think people should just keep that in mind when they're dealing with. Yeah, this. I mean, that always goes back to like the, the issue of atonement and accountability. They say it's accountability culture. But these things are supposed to come within. Peace is supposed to come within, not from a mob outside of your door. When people actually realize that they've done something wrong, they want to improve in some way, you atone to higher powers, you atone to people who actually love you, uh, you come to grips with things that you've done and you improve. You know, the whole idea that you're accountable to strangers, like I think that is the thing that I've had to learn over time is I don't have to respond to comments from people I don't know. Um, I choose to sometimes because I like to put my best foot forward, but uh, I don't owe you anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, as you just mentioned, I don't give a lot of these people my energy because every second that you're focused on the mob is a second that I'm not focused on my content creation, which I find a lot of the times when I ask people, how do they define cancellation? Because I'll have people say, well, you, you're you never, you're not canceled because look at, look at uh, how many subscribers now. you have on YouTube. <laughs> look at your platform, right? You you seem fine. And, and it's like, so that tells me that people are looking to have someone's livelihood destroyed. They're not thinking about the psychological effects that result of this or, or any of the other aspects, the harassment, the emotional distress, whatever. They're just thinking of, oh, you have money. You have a platform. You still have a job. So the cancellation wasn't successful. Uh, so I don't really give these people much time. But every now and then I might challenge someone publicly because this is how mobs operate. They they do it for show. It's like a spectacle because if you really wanted to hold someone accountable, like if you really wanted to set someone up for success and hold them accountable for something, you wouldn't have to do it in front of an audience. Uh, and yeah. and it, makes, it makes it look like you're doing it for for clicks, for impressions, for to say, hey, everyone, look at me. I'm helping in some way. The comments that have kept me up at night for real are when listeners and patrons of my podcast shoot me an email expressing like a disappointment with a certain thing that I said. Like these are people who are invested in the thing that I do. Those are the ones that I'm like, wow, 
I messed up on for this person. Like I, I should try to like unpack this thought a little bit more for them because they're invested in what we're doing and they're part of the community. And that's what makes it beautiful. But let's talk about solutions. So how do we beat cancel culture? The big million dollar question, this thing that is stressing out the entire nation because it's, it's twofold. It's gotta be culture, one, changing the culture that allowed for this to happen. And then it has also got to be, I think at some point, consequences for cancelers who are engaging in destructive activity. I mean, like Taylor Swift talked about this once with like the people who light up her inbox and her comments feed telling her to kill herself. Like, why are they not somehow accountable or liable if she did? Like, these are the kind of things that nobody is taking account for when people are being sought after by a mob. So can we talk about the culture first? Do you have a theory of what is broken in people who are allowing this to take over the society? I think that uh, cancel culture has is trendy. Uh, and I, I never remember it as bad as it is now. Uh, I remember back in the day, if someone said something that offended me, I would just walk away. Okay, that's not for me. I'm not going to engage. And now I, I find that people want you to uh, change how you how you present yourself or what you say or change your beliefs. Uh, and, and I think that people uh, conclude that they can do that by you know, uh, being aggressive with you on social media. So I think that, first of all, I think human beings are very tribal. And the reason that it cancel culture is as big as it is now is because it's become popular. Everyone, well, not everyone, but a lot of people do it, right? And a lot of people don't even know why they're doing it. They just know I'm angry. I'm going to help in some way by saying these mean things about this person just to exacerbate this mob. So I, I think that in the reverse, if people were to, uh, you know, get into the habit of challenging these folks on a public forum, then it'll signal to the other side, okay, if you're going to say some crazy nonsense about this person and or accuse this person of mm -hmm. something, then you should expect someone to challenge you on that. Prove it. Because one, one thing that I've started to see more is people uh, fabricating things about someone. Uh, so for me, uh, the narrative is that I hate black people, even though clearly I'm black. Uh, but they'll say, oh, <laughs> she, hates, she hates black people or she has, you know, white supremacist talking points. And, I, and I'll say, explain it. Explain it. What have I said? What have I done right, for you to come to that conclusion? You've internalized your whiteness. I've never gotten responses. I usually get blocked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh, so there's, there's the, like the one prong of like seeking social approval and a need to surround ourselves by people who back us up. We don't all have people who will back us up, right? Like I, I think the only thing that really saves you when people come after you is when people come to your defense. I worry about those who don't have that kind of support, that kind of community. Um, but then there's also the, the path of damages. So the liability question. Nick Sandman is somebody who I think has become sort of an example of a very high profile version of not cancel culture, but like defamation mixed with cancel culture, mixed with media malpractice. So the kid who stood in front of the, the Native American at the, at the Lincoln Memorial, he settled with CNN. Um, this is somewhere along the lines of defamation. But a lot of what cancel culture does, it's not always off of what's untrue. It's just off of people going after you because they don't like you. They don't like the thing you actually do believe or the thing you actually said. It makes me wonder if defamation is not really a viable route for this. Have you talked to kind of YouTubers, other people in your position who have a theory on it? I have not. Um, but, you know, like I said, I defamation, I do find to be at some point you'll find in most mobs that there's going to be some lies in there. And when you're dealing with a content creator, like like I said, I wasn't able to make content or make a living for a good year. Uh, and. Part of that was because people were spreading these lies about me and tarnishing my brand. Uh, so I, I personally think, again, because of how tribal people are, if these people that are using cancel culture as a tool for accountability start to see that with every online mob that starts, someone gets taken to court, I bet you eventually they're going to say, okay, maybe I should stop doing this. If that's a possibility, because it hasn't been. Nick is one of those cases 
where you have to be careful about what you say. You have to be careful about how you try to hold people accountable because it could come back to you. Yeah, I mean, you got to raise the stakes on the people who want to participate in this kind of behavior. If you are going to come after me, try to get me kicked off Patreon so people can't donate to my podcast and then, you know, like help me make my living, right? Or sell my book or whatever I'm doing. You know, I should be able to, if I had a lawyer, and I don't have a lawyer to handle this kind of stuff, but raise the cost of engagement. Um, but it is sort of like, it's it's like, uh, what's the theory? Mutually, mutually assured mass destruction or something with the uh, Russians and, uh, and America. Like, you both got big bombs and you want to make it really costly for both parties. But here's the problem. I have to pay for a lawyer if I'm going to do this. And I don't know how to do that. So again, like, it's only the people who have huge communities that can survive this kinds of stuff. Do you, is it going to trickle down, you think? Like if, the, if people like you stand up, that then people uh, further down the ladder with less followers can then do it as well. That's, that's what I think is, needs to happen. And I'm prepared to do that, by the way, uh, because I, I, I've, one thing that I've learned about this whole experience is that there are more people that are fed up with cancel culture than than those that actually in, enjoy using it as a tool for accountability. People are yeah. sick of cancel culture. Uh, but the reality is a lot of people uh, don't feel uh, comfortable standing up to the mob because I get it. You don't want to lose your job. You don't want uh, the mob to go after the people around you, which is another factor. When the mob realizes that they can't cancel you, they'll go for your job. They'll go for your family. They'll go for your friends. Uh, a lot of my original following over on Twitch stopped following me because they had people uh, DMing my supporters saying, hey, you should stop supporting this person. It was it was bizarre. So I think that if there are some uh, big public figures that are just make a point to just stand up to mob and say, I'm not going to take this, eventually it's going to trickle down. And I think that that's ultimately going to be the thing to help get us out of this situation. I did. I did a little research on this, this issue of, uh, of um, um, you know, how to approach it legally. And one of the tactics that I came across was covered by the Columbus School of Law. They had a brief on tort liability suits. And so tort liability suits apparently differ from defamation in that defamation is purely about making up stuff about people, which is in many cases like really hard to prove, especially when you're alleging like ideological things, like you're a white supremacist, you're a Nazi. Like these are things that are, they're in your mind uh, before they are like a, an affiliation. Um, that's really hard to do. But apparently like what tort liability suits do is purely go after people for disrupting economic arrangements between you and a third party, your sponsors, right? So if somebody goes after you, tries to get in between an economic arrangement, you and a sponsor, and they pump information, bad stuff about you towards the sponsor to break your deal, and they don't have any connection or reason to do it other than malice, then you can actually go after them for damages. But it gets kind of muddy uh, in the instances in which, like maybe it's a journalist, because a journalist's job is to dig up stuff on people. And so apparently if you're a journalist, you can kind of get past this tort liability thing. But an average citizen, you might be able to actually stand up to somebody on those grounds. I was encouraged when I found this because that actually made a little bit of sense. That's really good to know. I, I did not know that. Um, and it's it's funny that you mentioned that because I did have someone organize a mob to contact one of my previous sponsors and my, you know, and I was working with them for about two years and uh, it was literally over just my YouTube videos. I don't like your YouTube videos. So I'm going to send people to uh, harass your sponsors. Uh, That's a good and way to I ended up parting ways with them. Yeah. Well, I ended up parting ways with them because I said, I, you know, it, it, I know that the mob isn't going to stop and, and they're just going to keep harassing you and it's not fair to you. So we just parted ways after that. Uh, but that's good to know. Now, yeah, yeah, something to look into. I think this is going to be something that in the in the years to come, we will see some legal theories arise on how to protect people from this because the fear is just ratcheted up so high. Um, Vanessa, I've so appreciated meeting you and hearing about your story and your thoughts on this issue. Just to close us out, if you could give us a couple of tips on how to stand up to mobs online, just sort of like your 101 for cancellation survival, what would it be um, to, for everybody out there who is worried about this stuff? 
Okay. So first of all, if, um, I think that first of all, never apologize, uh, because at the end of the day, you're still apologizing to random strangers. And I, I think that that sets a, a bad tone for everyone else watching. So make it known. No, I'm not going to apologize, especially if it's for an opinion. Uh, if it is, uh, if it is a matter of, and by the way, we also have to be cognizant about how we interact with mobs because I'll see a lot of people that say, oh, I'm against cancel culture, but yeah. then they'll actively take in someone else's mob. Uh, so before you do that, think to yourself, am I involved in this situation? Whatever it is that I'm adding my two cents in, am I involved? Mm -hmm. Does it concern me? Okay, then maybe I shouldn't participate in this. Uh, and I would say another tip is, don't be afraid to challenge people. Uh, ask them basic questions. What, what's your goal? What are you doing? Uh, how are you helping? Um, and because like I said, I find that usually people are doing this because they're trying to help in some way or feel like they're helping. But uh, a lot of the times it's very, um, I, I find people just do it because it's, like I said, it's trendy. So I would say those. Trendy and they're unhappy people. Um, Vanessa Gothics, it's been real. Thank you for standing up and showing people how to do this. Um, for all of us who just don't know where we would be when the day actually comes where we have to make that, make that stand. Um, before we go, could you tell people uh, where to follow you, subscribe to your shows, kind of all your handles and plugs and stuff like that? Yeah, so you can find me at gothics.tv. Uh, I'm also on YouTube. I have a podcast called Subtweet This that's also on YouTube. Um, and uh, anything else I'm doing right now? Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> All right, you heard it here, folks. Um, this has been Vanessa Gothics. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. All right, and that is it for another episode of Right Now with Stephen Kent. That's me, and we will be back next week on Thursday. We hope you'll join us. Subscribe to us on YouTube. We are at RightlyAJ on all of our social platforms. We'll see you then.